or should say our speakers are. We have two speakers tonight, Mr. George Hall and Mr. Richard Kramer. And I'll ask Mr. Hall to introduce Mr. Kramer. George Hall is an architect who practices in Gary, Indiana. He's a partner in a firm there. He is Indiana's latest fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He was uh, honored by a fellowship in May in New York at our last AIA convention. At the same time, they honored 80 architects from around the country with fellowship in the AIA. He graduated uh, from Cornell University in architecture, where he was a, a classmate, or there at about the same time, as Skidmore and Owings of Skidmore Owings Merrill, Perkins and Will of the Perkins and Will Partnership, and also the, uh, the man who is president of Standard Life Insurance uh, Company in uh, Indianapolis, a man who doesn't practice architecture, who practiced for several years, went into the insurance business, but has uh, contributed about 40 books to our library, including that wonderful original copy of Ruskin's Seven Lamps of Architecture. George Hall is the Indiana Society of Architects representative to the Great Lakes Regional Planning Commission. And he'll be introducing tonight a special research project done this summer for the Great Lakes Regional Plan Commission, a study of the Calumet River. So I'd like to introduce George Hall. Well, I'm glad to be here this evening. I hope our program is, uh, proves interesting to you. It's a regional planning uh, study in uh, really a bi-state sub-region. But you might wonder why architects are getting into this uh, category of endeavor. But uh, it's been long a premise of mine that planning per se will best be uh, assimilated by people outside the design professions best by visual presentation. That the seeing of what might be if the money to be spent is spent uh, with a uh, orientation towards design and the benefits to the people, that the better relationship we can get between the public and other power groups that may be involved, governmental or private, is best attained when people can see what they're going to get. Uh, there's a new thrust in your American Institute of Architects Urban Design Committee, which is proving out this point that what people are really searching for now is to get the visual impact of what might be in all of the various study areas that we're looking at in our country today. This is going down through the landscape discipline, as exemplified by Ian McCarg in the uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, Professor Lewis at the University of Wisconsin in their ecological studies. These are essentially graphic, identifying in corridors of a probable development and then taking the corridors and identifying the things within the corridor that should be protected, enhanced, remodeled, or what. And uh, from that, the land uses are the places where people may build. In planning generally, I think one of the old planners of our time, Sam Zisman from San Antonio, says the whole premise of planning is to point out where not to build. Uh, the Lake Michigan Region Planning Council was organized in 1960. I'm giving you a little platform. I might talk six and, or three and a half minutes longer than usual 
because Dick Kramer wants to put some uh, marks on the big map back there. The Lake Michigan Region Planning Council came into being in 1960 as uh, four chapters surrounding the southern shores of Lake Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan, the chapters of Wisconsin, Chicago, northern Indiana, and western Michigan, to look at this developing regional city and to see and to alert in the public interest those things which might be implemented by more specific study, to take key things and try to hit them hard and bring them out and uh, at the same time working between the formalized agencies of planning within the region to assist them in crossing state lines, county lines, or whatever it might be in the interest of comprehensive planning. So our premise of the council is to foster comprehensive planning and it came into being through the uh, fight at the time over the controversy of the Indiana National Lake Shore Park, the Bethlehem the Steel Complex development uh, and the, uh, uh, in, in the dunes area bordering Lake Michigan. We have continued uh, since 1960 and have changed our bylaws now. We think we're ahead of the American Institute of Architects. Our membership is now open instead of having a professional advisory board of all the planning disciplines, whether they be economists, geographers, or planners, or uh, lawyers even that they are, be, they are permitted full membership and our board structure now d includes people other than architects as well as architects. So that our, our, uh, what we are looking for is the, is the, are the design disciplines and the comprehensive planning sense in one working body. Uh, the project we have tonight, the history of this project essentially is, we have, we have a river Oh, can you hear me all right? No, not in the back. I thought I was talking pretty loudly. Uh, can you hear me now? We have a river here in the late Little Calumet River in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Illinois, northern Indiana, crossing uh, uh, two states and uh, several counties. Uh, the Little Calumet River's uh, uh, main premise for our study, and the reason probably we got a grant and the funds to do it with, is the fact that it uh, connects at one end with Lake Calumet, the part of Chicago, and from the state line between Illinois and Indiana, the river flows into this port and out of the Cal Sag and in the Illinois and finally down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. From the Indiana line in an easterly direction, the river flows the opposite direction. So you have a river in two states flowing uh, in two different directions and running out of what we call Burns Ditch adjacent to the port of Indiana now being constructed. So you have two terminals to this river uh, in two states crossing a very heavily urbanized, industrialized area so that you have all the problems of any, it's a, it's a microcosm of the whole uh, gamut of problems of the river which has two ends to it and can be therefore studied as an entity without having a huge thing uh, in the nature of the Potomac Task Force or the Hudson uh, River Study. Uh, we, uh, we, we have been fortunate in the study to, well first, we, we have a grant from the National Foundation of the Arts and the Humanities, uh, which is a matching grant, and uh, an additional grant from the William Bain Foundation uh, which has funded this project. We have completed through, at this time, the visual material of this study, and we will take this into the printed report and the uh, graphics program for publication, uh, we hope, by the early part of next year. The, <clears throat> the grant premise is in, uh, is in keeping with the Lake Michigan Region Planning Council's slogan or format of comprehensive, foster comprehensive planning, that we are to take this area, which is being studied by the Corps of Engineers and the natural, uh, or the Department of Natural Resources of the state of Indiana at the present time, uh, from a channelization concept into what could this river region become through design? How, what could the transformation by design uh, uh, formulate for this uh, heavily urbanized region? We think we've got something that's pretty good, and the Army engineers have so 
told us out of the Chicago office at any rate. Uh, and they have given us the biggest pat on the back, I think, of any review meeting we've had. The team to do this uh, uh, was really a, a lucky break for me as chairman of the study. I originally selected a, a design team from the council membership uh, comprising uh, Charles B. Genther, Pace Associates in Chicago, FAIA, and Norman DeHaan uh, of Chicago. Uh, both of these men also teach at Circle Campus College of Architecture. Uh, Robert Schultz of the University of Notre Dame College of Architecture. And Herbert Reed, who is a longtime resident in the uh, Dunes area and quite a fellow for research and history, which we wanted to correlate in the briefest or the shortest possible time. And we had to get a staff to, to, to work, and uh, I was very uh, fortunate to, to have a connection with uh, Dick Williams of the University of Illinois uh, Graduate School. Uh, design head, and he came up with two wonderful boys in Dick Kramer, who has a master's degree from the University of Illinois in uh, architecture, and Franklin Clements, who has a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Illinois as of last June. My son, who was a graduate master's program at uh, University of California, Berkeley, was available. And uh, boy, <laughs> he, he gets haircuts. <laughs> and uh, then we had Jim Pavin, a fifth year architecture student from uh, Circle Campus, and Louis, Louis Johnson, fifth year student from Hampton Institute in Hampton, Virginia. And uh, these boys not only didn't know each other except for Dick and, and Frank Clements, but they uh, pitched in and worked so well together, you'd think they'd, uh, they'd been in the same office for quite some time. The major consultants we had on the project comprised uh, Professor Williams of uh, Illinois, Professor Lewis, who was uh, chairman of the Department of Landscape Architecture at Wisconsin, and uh, John Schaefer, who is a key member of the Institute for Urban Affairs at the University of Chicago, and Mark Reshkin, who is, and Schaefer is a hydrologist, and Mark Reshkin from the University of Indiana, a geologist. We met with the various regional planning commissions, Chicago Planning Commission, the Corps of Engineers, the Department of Natural Resources, etc. So that gives you a platform for uh, the discussion of the project itself, which uh, we feel is, uh, has a great deal of merit. And uh, as far as I personally am concerned, I, I must admit I, I learned some things, though I've lived in the area of, um, practically all my life uh, and worked there. I learned some, some things of what I can see in the future for the area that I didn't know were there before. And this has to do with how the urbanization of the Lake Porter area may take place. And I think the program, uh, it will be difficult for you to assess this particular point, but the program uh, visually makes this pattern very clear and gets right back to the very basic premise that Phil Lewis has of Wisconsin of identifying corridors, then identifying the pri priority of development for these corridors, then picking the highest priority corridors and defining specifics that need to be saved or protected or planned for in the most uh, uh, the corridors with the greatest priority to ensure some cohesiveness in the development of our future urban scene. I'll now turn the program over to Richard Kramer, uh, who has uh, been the administrative staff head as well as the design staff head for our uh, project this summer. And Dick, I might add, I told you he's a product of uh, the University of Illinois. He is now there teaching this year and doing a research, very interesting research project, which uh, uh, is being done in connection with some other research programs going on at Illinois in connection with the town of Western Illinois, which will have the new atomic energy, uh, energy something or other. It's bigger than all of us, I know that. And uh, 
Dick, uh, you carry on. Do I leave this here then? I don't know how much cord there is. Quite a lot. <laughs> Get all the lights, please. Mr. R gave a very good introduction, so I'll proceed into the project that we worked on this summer. I was telling one of the staff members tonight at the dinner that before Last spring, I didn't really go to Ball State University of Muncie, Indiana, until I attended a per game rifles drill team then in Urbana and saw students walking around with their sweat shirts on saying BSU. And I found out <laughs> that I left Ball State University. <laughs> Our study really concerned an area that has a lot of natural beauty, some of it's being preserved, some of it's being destroyed. This is at Dune Acres, which is located very near to the Indiana Dunes National Park. It's an area of most Indiana Indians should know of unswept trees and sand dunes. Housing is very uh, low density. And there are scenes in the backwaters of the little Chattanooga River that resemble this. <coughs> the Lake Shore at Indiana Dunes State Park. The Lake Shore at Indiana Harbor, or Burns Harbor. Much of the sand dunes have been removed to Northwestern University in Chicago and it's now being constructed there a large harbor facility for the steel complexes that are building around it. This is the Bethlehem complex. You can see the Indiana Harbor construction in the upper right of the picture. Roughly on the map, this is where we're at. Does this thing move? Let's see if the other one goes first. Try this one. Ditch. Does not drain out. 
the typical scene. Oh, the typical scene in Gary. This is a U.S. Steel complex. There's a few ashtrays and everything else is all there. That's just all you can do. As you can see, the area is crisscrossed with railroads, parking lots, steel buildings, and smoke. And at the top is the lake shore of this natural state. In this area, we have much forestation and a series of beach shows, which we should consider a scientific area to be preserved. This land has been farming land for the development of the steel mill. It's an alternation between a marshy area, which is some of the old points here, and a scrub oak or scrub timber area in the high points. I'll point out the formation of this particular topography when we get to our diagram. The U.S. Steel Company. Gary Harper. U.S. Now the area right here is pointing at Deep River, the tributary of the Locate Bend. Deep River goes to the harbor and it presents a very desirable river setting. There's a lot of open space yet in the area. There's a lot of open space yet in the area. Especially with the highway intersection. Highway take up a tremendous amount of space in the low cutting that region. The tri state or Interstate 94 and Interstate 80 is this one. This is Interstate 65, which is being completed in the Atlas. At the top is the intersection of Interstate 65 with the Totalwood. The region is receiving a high volume of traffic because most of it is funneled around the southern tip of Lake Michigan right through the locality of that region. This is Gleason Park in the area. The river runs here. Indiana University is in the upper right part of the slide. Broadway is the main cross street. Draw courses and still open space. The river setting in the area. Many choices the highway has forced the river through culverts and ditches, creating a, a, a very hazardous flood problem around the particular area of the area and farther west. This is a very nice movement on the river, but it's a very natural setting. Here's the river in conjunction with the farm line in the area. You see the river running its way in a very natural, say, a marshy land and green space. Also, people have decided to leave some of their settings around. The material situation exists in conjunction with the Tri-State Highway, and that is the borrowing of land to be used to elevate the highway that you see in that cross-range, and thereby creating a number of what we call borrow pits or borrow lakes. This one has to be about a 20 acre lake. The potential of such a lake in relationship to the Little Calumet River Park Corridor, which we propose to support a much higher concentration of population, to have a zone such as this of uh, high density housing around the lake, even crossing over the Tri State, providing a physical tie to the river, 
and more access to water and paid sports. Much of the housing for the Mokai Man River has taken advantage of the river that you can see right here. Instead of facing the river, the prior ministry in the area, they actually were in the east apartment houses to the highway, ignoring completely the river. This is the case of most areas along the time in it. Take the half house. This is the entire The reorganization of the river a better case. Most of the happiness that does recognize the river is limited to the few that are on the very edge. The majority of the public does not have access to the river either physical access or business access. And you can see these houses face the road, but their backyards do face the river. This is the river. We were primarily concerned with the little cabin at the river park floor. As I put it up, and then we realized there are about five or six corners of the individual study. And then these individual studies need to be put together into a regional comprehensive plan. But we could not neglect getting our ideas of what could happen to the shoreline that is dominated now by the steel industry of what we would call the steel coast. This is going to be our own thin steel and this is carbon. Inland, we got this amount of landfill for this part of St. Gabriel City. And that's what the city realized that they weren't going to have that of a view. And we're going to have the sea of park cars right beside their park. The location for the map. This is the end of the finger here, Indiana Harbor, in Chicago. Now, the Tribune reporter here in Chicago decided to finish Indiana Harbor in the pollution. I don't know how many people have received a tribute down here, but they have a very active program of any solution for like this one. Anyhow, we put these hands out, this is what we have. This stuff flows down into the into the city water supplies, and it creates a considerable hazard to the health of the river as well. In the East Chicago area, to give you an idea of the type of housing people are living in, it is mostly this type of relatively high density housing, but there is this type of housing that you always think of. There's a great need for redevelopment. There's a great need for creating a better environment. An area that has a reputation for air pollution and water pollution. Our primary objective was to show people that they can create a new reputation, a reputation which will tell the resident to tell the rest of the United States that we can create a good environment in association with India. The way from the East Chicago back to the river. This is an indication of 
a prime area that could be developed for recreation and receive the city water. It also shows levees that were constructed to force the flood waters through the river instead of letting it go over its natural floodplain, which people and wives have constructed their houses. There are some 8,000 houses that would be affected by a flood. One method of flood control would be to buy these 8,000 houses, take them out of the floodplain, and let the normal course of the river take its way. This would cost about $150 million to do this. So it's not too feasible. These levees aren't too feasible either, and they are softer. People living behind them are living with false security because software didn't hold back in the water. It'll go right through it. Another, what could have been a river oriented shopping center, and what turned out to be an interfacing shopping center, an interfacing port. There are several of these in Chicago, Oakland, Old Oakland, this and that to be a and the river is now there are recognitions of good aspects of the river, such as this. And I don't know exactly what they're getting at here. Obviously, they don't want to do it the river. But this is the park regulation uh, sign posted on the side of the fence to keep people away from the river. Perhaps they're afraid they'll fall into the blue water. On the other hand, one of the best recognitions of the assets of river oriented recreation has been taken by the Cook County Forest Preserve. I can't get them all the credit because they put on a big program to buy land for preservation of open space, and it just so happens that most of the very desirable recreation land is also the cheapest. So they acquired a number of highly wooded areas. This would have to be very near to the point where the little cat that runs into the side of the mill. Across the way is the River Queen that never did make it back to the river of <laughs> The front of the way first would have a great drawing crowd of the floating restaurants in the area associated with the Deer Center or additional recreation facilities. Some more scenes in the very same area. Fishing boats left to die. No more fishing in the Lake No more fishing in Lake Michigan. Deteriorating private docks. Nice landscape. But there's very little use of the river because it's highly polluted here, primarily because it's slow moving and stagnant. It's singing, and as for painting, I'm talking about artistic painting, but uh, it's deterioration. And there's more. Of it. This is the Lokaizan River. Part that is a link between the St. Lawrence Seaway, Lake Michigan, and the Mississippi River. The highly silted bottom shows a black sewer in the barge goes through when you're up in the air. The steel industry located at a prime turn in the or bend in the river, very high polluted water almost the next time. You can see they're putting their part of the pollution into the river. Mixed uses, in this case, a private arena, a boat area down here, and a school industry here. The first characteristic green water doesn't resemble a clear recreational area type of water. Here's that bar again. You can see the churn up of the silk on the bottom of the kind of that river. The top of the picture 
here is a brand lot. This lot keeps Lake Michigan about 18 inches higher than the Calcine Canal, which is on this side. In other words, every time the locks are open, they have 18 inches of water flows into the locks and then flows on and up into the Calcine Canal, into the Illinois River, into the Mississippi River, and eventually into the Gulf of Mexico. It's not hard to see why the Mississippi River has been called the sewage disposal river of America. This is all six words. So. Any advice for our hands? <coughs> there are some striking shapes along the river. The very well accentuated as they into an extremely desirable tour to track the harbor of the river, the old cabinet harbor, the steel industry. It's all extremely dramatic, fascinating. You might be like saying that. Anyone that has been a tour of the field of prices, the steel mill, or the kind of harbor by, by a boat, I would love to hear this. Great. Go by the lot to you. And the Lake Cagnet Harbor. This is Lake Cagnet and Great Dot to become one of the largest harbors in America. This water is very clean. There's no pollution in the air. It bypasses the pollution. This is back in the major part of the Cagnon River. This is the cold way that crosses over the harbor, giving a nice view. Of course, in the air, the water does come to the surface. This is probably one of the most polluted creatures you have. Bank, and smoke, and coal, and fire, and red smoke, and steel mills, all that, all that stuff in that picture. Nice playground. This is all the way to the harbor. Here's like the next thing right into the harbor. This part here is kind of in harbor. It's long. Oh. From the shore of the Lake Michigan, southern Chicago, the steel mills of the background of U.S. Steel on the mouth of Lake Kaiser, the Kaiser Harbor. It's a very clear day. Would you switch on the other projector, please? and then Ford wrapped around me in a little while. In our scheme of things, our primary objective was to capitalize upon the topography of the area, the industry of the area, In other words, the general assets that are available, as I said, there's too many cords. That's all right. I don't need that one. Lake Michigan was formed by a glacier which receded in periods, leaving various beaches or, or deposits from the glacier. We had Glenwood Beach here, Cabinet Beach here, Halston Beach here, 
eventually it got back to its present location. The Kankakee River is down here. The Kankakee Outwash Plain here. The black line indicates the boundary of the Low County Met River drainage basin, or the watershed. In other words, all the water drains in now the Calumet River. In its original state, the Old Calumet River started running over by Chester, Chester, wound around, following the area, Carroll's. The Deep River came in here. Thorn Creek came in here. Wound around. Stony Creek came in here. Back up on itself, going out what is now the Grand Calumet River, and this started the from Lake Michigan. That was in its original state. We had sand dunes here, and sand dunes here, beach shoals. The gray area is a floodplain area, and marshes down here. One of the most desirable natural spaces in the United States. The Little Calumet River Shed, the river basin water shed, here inside the black area is in the brunt of several forces, number one being the urban pattern. This black indicates the present situation of urbanization. Taking in South Bend, Gary, Dahlia, Chicago, Milwaukee. The projected urban corridors are growth down the Illinois River corridor here. Peoria, on out to Moline and Davenport, and into a, to a corner to Detroit, connecting this and the only Midwestern megalopolis. The river basin is in the center. The river basin here is in the center of major cross country transportation. The railroads are too numerous to even map that crisscross the area. So Interstate Highway 80 is the major east-west New York, Chicago, San Francisco highway. Others coming in, 57, 55, 65, coming in, 90, 94. Today we have a situation like this versus the natural state. The outline of the watershed basin Four Creek, Peach River, or Calumet River, Calumet Lake. Mr. Burns came in, a better ditch here. Park ditch was constructed. Most, if not all, of the Kentucky Alvarez plain was ditched for drainage by the farmers. The industry developed a lake shore here. Chicago Loop is up here. The Chicago Sanitary Canal goes out here. The Calumet Sag Canal goes here. Reversing and changing the drainage of the Little Calumet River from a high point approximately at the state line, which is here, making this portion drain out Burns Waterway in Lake Michigan, and this portion drain out the Calumet Sag Canal into the Illinois Inland Waterway System, eventually into Mich the Mississippi River coming down to the Calumet Harbor and out like so. The black shows the area that is being affected by flooding. This gray is the urbanized portions of the region. Marquette Park here, Dunes Park here, and a series of lakeshore parks in Chicago. The primary first step that we were concerned with was creating a system for the river. As you saw on the last slide, the flood situation is this. Destination Site Canal, Illinois, and Mississippi Rivers, Destination Burn Ditch, and Lake Michigan. Approximately a 35 mile area that we were concerned with. The Grand Calumet River drains out Indiana Harbor forcing all that pollution you saw in the Grand Canyon in Lake Michigan. One solution to 
flood control is providing a wide and effective channel for fast, fast flood water movement and storage. We can also utilize this channel for recreational navigation by making it deep enough so that the flood, so that the water from Lake Michigan will back up into the channel and boating would be allowed. If we provide a navigational lock here and a barrier dam so that the floodwaters, Illinois has one in and it's floodwaters in this town, but the floodwaters will go out this way and out this way, we can have a continuous circuit of recreational navigation even into the side canal, Illinois Inland Water System in Mississippi River. This would look in cross-section something like this, with the original river actually being higher than the level of Lake Michigan in some areas. The original river is very narrow. The channel would have to be approximately 300 feet wide. We would have a rather brutal situation if this alternative is taken. Flood water is actually stored in a artificially made floodplain. Another proposal which we are concerned with is the utilization of tunnels here, 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 which would be cut through bedrock underground, leaving the surface undisturbed. These tunnel systems would have inlets at these various points where flood water, when it got up, could be diverted into the tunnel and discharged in the lake carrying bed and these two in the lake mission. At the same time, we could utilize these tunnels, which would be filled with water from Lake Michigan, and a pumping station at these points to pump water into the tributaries and into the river thereby augmenting this low flow, which I was talking about before, which means the river is very stagnant. To pump water into the river would create a flow, clean the river, and improve water quality. We would still have, at this point, a barrier dam, navigational lock, since the water here would be 18 inches higher than it would be on this side. Remember, Lake Michigan is, is 18 inches higher here and here, and this is lower. At the same time, we could utilize an existing tunnel, which Hammond has for their water supply, to augment the flow at the high point. Put in a few retention basins for fishing and recreation purposes, and retain some of the natural character and setting of the river. In cross section, our pumping tunnel system would be covered to this. The tunnels can be up to 22 feet in diameter. The exact dimension would have to be determined by an engineering survey. But in the case of Indiana, all the water pumped into the tributaries in the Little Cayman River would return to Lake Michigan. In the case of Illinois, it would be lost down the Illinois River. Cross-section of the retention basins shows, again, the original river, a more narrow natural setting, the use of landforms taken from the diggings, the possibility that there would be a flow of smooth, clean surface water, which would be desirable for a fish population. And this would give us a large space, which we could have, which is required, 30% uh, of the surface area has to be at least 12 feet deep for fish. Now in our proposal, we have, is this clear? This study shows the transportation, the existing transportation. Tri-state highway, a tollway coming down here, Calumet Expressway here. These green areas are existing forest preserves in Cook County. This is a golf course, Gleason Park here, Lake Calumet here, Wolf Lake here. Well, 
I got that one in. This was one I wanted next. This shows the yellow shows the indication of or shows the agricultural areas primarily down here. The dark gray is industry in here. The little dots represent schools. Again, we have our green forest preserve area. This shows the proposal which we are making the brown indicating a higher density population, the preservation of agriculture, the white being the industry, the gray being the existing urbanization, urbanized areas, the green park border here, and a system of parkways <coughs> paralleling the park corridor. Now, this slide, I want to bring up the board. I'm going to go ahead and run through the rest of the slides, and then I'll explain our concept of our proposal a little more fully. One of the things we're concerned with in any flood proposal situation is, such as, this is the existing this is the existing burn ditch. This would be the widening of the, the flood control. This is what we would be concerned with. How would we recreate a desirable amenity that in this case is already there, or how do we create it to begin with? Would it be a hard edge or a soft edge? Here we have this sort of a situation on a, on a canal. Could we utilize the dredgings to make landforms and a more unique landscape on the area? Here we have a profile of, of this proposal. And here we have a possible profile of the proposal utilizing landforms to create points of view and so forth. In Chicago, we we'll see the use of landforms are provide a very desirable point for looking around, putting statues on, and so forth. In the industrial area, we have another situation. We have something like this, which shows industry as it is today, pollution. Hoping that someday the pollution will be curtailed, and if they stick to the present schedule, it should be by the end of 1968. Perhaps industry can screen their operations, make their operations, their industrial sites even more attractive by dramatizing the shapes, utilizing landforms, soft water edges, so that the river traveler has a little more desirable view of things than he has today. Another use of landform could be utilized in dumping. Today there, there's this situation where the dump truck comes out and it goes right into the river, filling in a floodplain area that already is too full or they're, because they're having serious flood problems. So if it could be utilized by stacking it in a situation that could be landscaped from the bottom up, screening the dumping operation, eventually we could have a high point for views and an interesting spot in the park. At this point here, it happens to be the state line. This is a large shot, a blow up shot of the proposal design scheme. Here's that state line. Here's the river going through. This happens to be in Hammond. Hammond also has here a large residential area with a pretty good sized marshalling yard placed right in the middle of it. Now the possibilities of a better utilization of land and close relationship to the river amenity has a lot of 
fascinating sidelights, one of them being air rise developments. An air rise development over the marshaling yard, a state line marker here where we would need anyhow a barrier dam, a pumping point, a navigational lock, could all lend a much more desirable environment to the Calumet, Little Calumet River Park corridor. Here we're talking about Gleason Park, Indiana University area. Here, this particular area now needs a physical tie not only to the university but to the river. This can be done by creating an inlet underneath the Tri-State Highway into an area providing access for pedestrians under the highway and in this case over the highway creating a higher density development area, here being the inlet, the over back here, providing some high points for a view up and down the park corridor. In this case, the need for a large retention basin here near South Holland in Illinois could be developed like this. Again, there's a large marshaling yard in this area which could be utilized for air rights developments. Housing in relationship to such bodies of water can provide numerous opportunities to create desirable living conditions that uh, aren't being exploited to their fullest right now. This is a wild sketch of a traveler's rest area at the intersection of the highways. Possibility of creating all kinds of recreation along the river is endless. One of the side lights of this initial study, which was actually a starting point for a series of additional studies, that is being presently being undertaken by undergraduate thesis students at Circle Campus in Urbana and Notre Dame, and will be undertaken by some of the students here at Ball State. One of the questions that we asked these students was to define recreation. Just what is it? What do you think recreation is? And then des design some new innovations, design some new recreation related to river such as the Little Calumet. Our primary concern, however, is housing. Realizing that population response to industrialization and, and industry is expanding in this area, there's going to be a great increase in population. It is possible that in the next two decades, the population in this region here could triple. With the creation of the River Park Corridor and the judicious use of the open spaces that are there now and the full exploitation of the flood control proposal that is presently being studied, a much higher concentration of population could fit desirably into the area. Back to the river, an example that I pointed out before of the River Oak Shopping Center, the river running right by it, the possibility of a river-oriented shopping center opening, opening at the airport and being using their parking facilities, which are a sea of asphalt, which is a sea of asphalt around the center, to double for parking facilities for higher density housing. There's just so much that could be considered, that could be feasible if the right emphasis is put on the river. I'm going to wind up the slide portion of the discussion. I should say lecture. I haven't heard. Anyhow, 
by showing a few good examples of Chicago, river-oriented recreation, amenities, and so forth. This being Marina. Now this is at Riverside, Illinois. Shows the use of water going over a, a small dam. This is on the Chicago River, a development by Skidmore Williams and Merrill. What kind of uses can we actually put the riverside to? Bicycling, hiking, all kinds of uses can be designed into a river park border. This is on the Chicago River, and the Wrigley Building is the one in the center. There's many places along the Little Calumet River that could have an environment such as this. I would like at this time to bring the map board forward. Uh, if we could turn off the slides and turn the lights on. That's it. I suppose everybody'd like to uh, kind of relax and stand up, but I think uh, they're going to move the big board up here while they're doing that. I'd like to. Everybody can stand up and listen to me if you want to, or just take it easy. Uh, as, a, as a person interested in many ways in the Calumet area, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to point out some of the things that are plus factors. For example, the uh, Air and water pollution in the area is being diligently pursued. And in the case of the Gary Mills, uh, they have reached a point of reduction by approximately 42%. And the, the main uh, out, when they get the direct oxygen furnace uh, continuous casting operation underway, the total reduction of air pollution will be extremely noticeable. In fact, in the, from the air, the work that has been done in the U.S. steel plant in the way of automation and computer uh, equipment is evident in what we call the West Mills, and to me as a longtime uh, resident of, uh, of the area, to fly over this mill makes me feel as though the whole place is on strike. It just can't be that clean. And when you think, if you can think, in, in the next 10 years, 5 to 10 years, a vast area of this uh, you can go over Bethlehem Steel, which is a new plant, and has these things built in. And uh, the uh, uh, the air uh, pollution reduced to uh, uh, a negligible amount, this whole area is going to have a completely different look. The whole area of the industry is going to become a tourist attraction. The whole area of the Steel Coast is a tourist attraction. It has not been realized as such, nor developed as such. I think these things will come about. I'd like to point out, too, that the Little Calumet River program that the Corps of Engineers is studying for uh, feasibility uh, is, is primarily aimed at, at fl uh, flood control, flood abatement. Uh, the other factor is to see if it's feasible in doing this uh, flood abatement project and using the river solely for recreation, whether it would pay off. Uh, what we're trying to show here, and we'll show with our written report material, is that we are creating a new economic land structure that will more than pay off using the recreational uses of the water, orienting the water to people uses. And uh, I was, uh, uh, see if I got anything else important to say. Um, 
amused at a TV program recently when they had uh, Philip Johnson and Carl Warnicke and Bucky Fuller and Ada Louise Huxtable on an interview program. And they asked, what is the, dif what is the difference in architectural practice today as of, uh, say, 15, 20 years ago? You know, the best answer came from Ada Louise Huxtable, but this was uh, to be expected. Uh, after all, Philip Johnson and Carl Warnicke only run big firms. They couldn't answer this problem easily when really it's people-oriented programs. This is, the, this is what we think of today. How do we do whatever we do to the benefit of the most people in wherever the program is located? And in looking at this, and in looking at urban design, and in looking at the premise of the architect in the future, I always think that it was said best by Elio Saarinen when he said, whenever you get a project, look for the bigger one. Take the bigger view. See what's around it. See what it will do. What will it what impetus can your program give to other programs that are interrelated? Now, this takes you down the road of uh, poor economics and possibly not making such a good profit. You perform much greater service, however. And I can only say to students that uh, if you take this philosophy in your work, there's always something bigger out of anything you take on. And uh, certainly Dick Kramer will buy it as far as the Little Calumet River is concerned, because when we got into it, we didn't think we were getting into a completely new urbanization corridor that itself uh, calls for a development. And we think this new urban pattern, this new urban corridor, can get great impetus from three basic things that are already built in, not including fixing up the river, which we're going to spend money to do. Why not do it right? Why, why does it have to cost a lot more to make lagoons and, and retention basins says, against digging a great big 600-foot uh, uh, right-of-way, which in many cases parallels the tri-state right-of-way already, which when you add the two together in the space between, you've got a swath of 1,000-plus feet cutting right across two counties, right across several cities, and successfully dividing the cities in half. Why not try to interrelate these areas so that both sides of the river, both sides of the highway count? And uh, in, in this new urban pattern, we have three, three basic uh, impetus providers. We have Purdue University Calumet Campus in Hammond, which is adjacent to the floodplain. We have Indiana University Northwest Campus in Gary, which is on the edge of the floodplain. And we have, because of the Indiana University growth pattern, an, uh, an open space acquisition program on the part of the park district of the city of Gary to acquire more parkland than they now own where Indiana University is, and you would have a new focal element of the city bordering the Little Calumet River. You see, these things are there. They're tangible. They're something you can build from. They're right there, and the money will be spent. And all we say is, not it good business to provide for the people that are going to live, go to school, work in that particular area. Isn't it worth something to think, how can you aesthetically orient the functional uses, the flood control, the pollution, all this sort of thing, <coughs> to the people living in there like they do in Holland, like they do in along the Rhine River, and like they do in the Danube, and the, and the uh, salts Scombergut area in Europe, done all the time. And it has to be done in our country on the basis of public interest, public participation, because we have no overall directive that can hand down regional, bi-regional, bi-state decisions that says this is what we're going to do, this is the control we'll follow. We have to have all the voluntary participations of the people in two-state region. And we think that with further study and broader study, more specific programming, this can be attained in our area because after all, the Chicago region is the second main region of the United States. 